What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. In a previous video we explained and kind of drilled down the basics of threads and concurrency in a computer program. So in today's video we are going to take a look at how concurrency is actually implemented in Java. To do this we will start by covering the volatile and synchronized keywords and then check out atomic variables. First on our list is the volatile keyword. This keyword can only be used in field declarations. So it is important to note that methods, classes, local variables, and parameters cannot be declared as volatile. Now, before actually diving in what this keyword allows us to do with the field, we need to understand these two concepts, visibility and mutual exclusion, also known as atomicity. Mutual exclusion means that only one thread or process can execute a block of code at a given time or do updates on shared data via a certain block of codes. Visibility means that changes done by one thread to shared data are visible to other threads or processes. Now, even if this isn't the best way to think about it, and you'll know why during the video, but you could think of them as read and write. One ensures that the read functionality is thread safe, and the other ensures that the write functionality is safe to run across multiple threads in the most efficient way. Now, let's spark this thought a bit and think, how can this happen? How can a variable be read differently by two processes? Imagine we have a shared variable, let's say an interest rate, stored in the main memory equal to 3%. The processor 1 reads it, it doesn't need to change it, just to apply it on a certain value in its program. Then another process, 2, the admin processor, let's say, wants to increase the interest from 3% to 3.5%. But the thing is, processor 1 has already cached this interest value in its internal memory to avoid going back and forth to the main memory and provide a faster user experience. Therefore, the value used by the processor 1 in his next operations will remain 3% instead of 3.5 until its cache is reset, unless we define this field variable as volatile. How will volatile solve the issue here? Well, the volatile keyword ensures visibility without mutual exclusion, which means that volatile variables are never cached. Hence, reads are done from the main memory directly. So, the thread must reconcile its working copy of the field with the master copy every time it accesses the variable. In our example here, only processor 2, the admin processor, has access to change this shared variable to write. However, we may have more than one thread reading the same variable, so we need visibility, meaning that whenever this variable is modified, this modification needs to be visible by all the threads of our application. Therefore, we need to use the volatile keyword. But that is actually why there are very few needs of this keyword, as a simple instruction such as I++ needs both to read and write. Because you see in this simple instruction, we first need to retrieve the value of i and then increment it. And in this case, we require both visibility and atomicity. Imagine that in our previous example, the first processor also had the right to change the interest rate. Now, even though the changes are done directly to the main memory because of the volatile keyword, nothing prevents both processors to execute the write operation at the same time and mess things up. That is where Java synchronized keyword comes in. The synchronized keyword ensures both mutual exclusion and visibility. In Java, the synchronized keyword can be used on methods or to wrap blocks of code. And actually what it does is, it tells the compiler that one and only one thread is allowed to enter this block of code at the same time, and that all variables created inside this synchronized method or block are to be flushed and updated directly on the main memory. So the volatile keyword will read from the main memory one field only, but the synchronized keyword will do so on all variables wrapped inside it. In case of the synchronized keyword, you are in control of what you want to do. So if you choose to wrap only read operations on one field variable with the synchronized keyword, then you are better off using the volatile keyword as it provides less overhead on your Java application. And on the other hand, if you choose to wrap with the synchronized keyword both read and write operations, then both reads and writes will be done directly from and to the main memory at one point in time, and both mutual exclusion and visibility will be ensured. 
But what if we want to execute read and write operations in a threat-safe environment on one field variable only without having to deal with the synchronized keyword? Don't worry, Java has provided us with the atomic variables, and that is exactly what they allow us to do. Let's first break down this notion by explaining what an atomic operation is. It is derived from the word atom, like the smallest operation one can do. So, for example, I equals 1 is an atomic operation, as it consists of one and only one operation, which is setting the value of I to 1. Let's consider now I equals I plus 1. Is this an atomic operation? It may look simple, but it can actually be broken down into three smaller atomic operations, where first we retrieve the value of I, then we increment this value by 1, and then we set the new value of i to be the value we just incremented. So an atomic operation is not only the smallest operation or an operation that cannot be broken down, it is also an operation that is performed entirely or not executed at all, similar to a database transaction. Like, you can't retrieve half of the variable i. Either you retrieve it or you don't, right? You can't say, I may have set i to 1, Either it was changed to 1, or it remained equal to its old value. However, in the case of i equals i plus 1, you can come to the conclusion that, yes, I may have retrieved the value of i and incremented it, but while trying to update this value, I don't know, uh, the application crashed, and only two out of the three operations we have were performed. That is exactly where the word atomic comes from in the atomic variables. Operations executed on atomic variables are either executed entirely or aren't at all, because they operate in a threat-safe environment. Let's take a look at a few examples in code, and after that I guarantee that you will have a better understanding of atomic variables. Let's suppose we have a customer class, and that every time we create a customer, the ID of the customer should be automatically incremented. Now, to implement this, the first step we need to do is create an ID counter field inside the customer class. And for the sake of this example, we are going to make this field a static one, so that its value is shared among all customer objects. Now, a better approach would have been to read this value from a certain table in a database or a file, or maybe to not create it at all and use the values of the IDs already stored, if stored, to guess the next increment. But in our case, what we wrote will do just fine. Next, in the customer constructor, every time a new customer is created, we need to increment the value of the counter and set this value to be the ID of the newly created customer. However, notice the concurrency problem with this approach. If more than one customer is being created at the same time by different threads, there is a chance that both of them will be assigned the same ID. Moreover, setting the variable to volatile will not solve our problem as every processor in charge of creating customers will need to both read its value and then modify it, in this case incremented by 1. So, to solve this problem, on top of setting the variable to volatile, we will need to wrap the incrementing logic inside a synchronized block, or to extract this logic to a separate method, and set this method to be synchronized. We just made the creation of our customers thread safe. Now, why are we going through all of this? And what does atomic variables have to do with what we just implemented? Well, the same results achieved using this method, the increment method we created, can be obtained if we transform our counter to an atomic integer and use the get and increment method provided by its class. You see, this method will ensure that no more than one thread is incrementing this variable at the same time and that its value is read directly from the main memory. In addition to this method, you have the increment and get method. They basically do the same thing under the hood. However, one of them returns the current increment and the second returns the next one. So if the counter is equal to zero, which is our case, and we used the get and increment, it will return a zero for us and then increment the counter to one. However, the increment and get on top of incrementing will return the result of the incrementation, which is one. The most commonly used atomic variable classes in Java are atomic integer, atomic long, atomic boolean, and atomic reference. These classes represent an int, long, boolean, and object reference respectively, which can be atomically updated. 
Additionally, two main methods exposed by these classes, other than the increment ones we just covered, are the get and set methods. The get method will retrieve the value of the atomic variable from the memory so that the changes made by other threads are visible and taken into account. That is equivalent to reading a volatile variable. On the other hand, the set method writes the value to memory directly so that these modifications are visible to all other threads, and that is equivalent to writing a volatile variable. Another heavily used atomic method is the compare and set one. This method takes two arguments as parameters and checks if the value of the atomic variable stored inside the memory is equal to the first expected value passed to the method. If that is the case, then the value of this variable is set to the new value or second parameter passed to the method. If that isn't the case, and the value stored is not equal to the expected one, then no changes are applied, as you can see in the first example in front of you. So, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching, take care, and I will see you in the next one.